folding props for mini quads. Now, folding props are nothing new. However, as mini quad people, we typically don't consider folding props for our quads because it, is, it, it, does, it wouldn't even cross our minds. <laughs> the prop that you see on the left is the Lumineer 6.7 by who knows what. And that's the first folding prop that I tried for mini quads. And what was most surprising about this prop is that it flew really, really well. So let's back up for a second. This mini quad prop was not designed for mini quads. It was actually designed for, I think, a Kickstarter project that kind of went south, like every other drone Kickstarter project, I think, out there. Have any of them actually delivered? I recall the Lily drone. Anyways, this was originally designed for that, and they kind of made it uh, dual purpose and <laughs> thought maybe they could use it for more markets than just that. And it's a 6.7 inch prop because of that reason. And it's also made of a glass nylon material. And so some of the most interesting things about this prop is that you would expect this hub area to weigh a lot more than a traditional prop, but this 6.7 inch prop is lighter than many, if not most, 6 inch props that are tri-blades. And there's actually only one 6 inch prop that's a tri-blade that comes to mind that is lighter, and that's the uh, Racecraft 6 by who knows what, but it was like 5.6 grams or something. It was as light, it was almost as light as a 5 inch prop, but it was a 6 inch prop. Now this prop here, I think it's like 6.1 gram or something. Whatever it is, it flew incredibly nicely. It's very smooth. It, uh, the folding mechanism did not seem to affect anything at all. The response is fanta unusually fantastic for a 6.7 inch prop. That may have a lot to do with the material that it's made of. It is made of a glass nylon material. It is rather flexible. But after I flew that prop, I started talking to prop manufacturers because I feel like there's a, there's a number of advantages to folding props that we can take advantage of, and the performance is surprisingly not impacted. So let's first talk about the performance of this prop, the 5 by who knows what, four or five, whatever it is. Whatever it is, it's uh, micro heli. I just randomly found it on one of these websites and I just picked up a couple, not a couple, exactly one set just to try because I was expecting it to be total garbage. And as you can see, the blades kind of like are really flimsy and fold out on themselves, like really flimsily, <laughs> as you can see. And um, something really interesting about this prop is that when you arm your quad, you get this kind of like shutter. The quad just shutters as it flings out all the blades. But once the blades are flinging out, it doesn't really impact anything at all. In this case, you can see that the blade actually, let's see if I can focus on it. The blades, they, they kind of move up and down on the hub too. So I wouldn't expect this to be a positive thing for us at all, but it seems to work totally fine. And uh, so the, the performance of this blade, it it's hard to say because it performs really awful. If you've flown, if you if you even remember what the old uh, doll five by four five bullnose tri blade props feel like, that's sort of what this prop feels like. However, it has better response than I expected. I was expecting this thing to have really cheesy response because. It's a 4.9 gram blade, where, which is lighter than I expected as well. I don't know if that has to do with the folding mechanism, but I mean, just look at it. It's got a really thick bull nose on the end of it. It's, got, it's a really aggressive blade. I did not expect this prop to be as responsive as it was. So it is a little bit more responsive than it is. It's also a little bit more powerful than I expected it to be as well because it's a folding prop. I did expect the blades to kind of fold around in the pair with an aggressive blade, but maybe that was a fallacy of thought because I could not detect any difference at all with respect to the foldingness and if it was an impact or anything at all. However, it did seem to feel more responsive than I expected it to feel. So the prop flies totally fine. It's just not a design, not a prop design I would generally recommend to anybody for anything because it is grossly inefficient. Uh, the throttle curve is not good. It's got a real big pump of power down low and then it kind of just drains your battery dry up at the top. Not something I would, I would recommend. It, the best analogy I could make for it is it's like trying to cut a steak with a butter knife. It kind of just doesn't work out very well. And you can probably tell by my flying that it doesn't, it just doesn't really fit. But in open air, not when I'm around objects, it performs totally fine. And the response, like I keep saying, is higher than I would expect for a 4.9 gram prop with this aggressive of a pitch and just this general design. And so, 
let's talk about the potential benefits of folding props and why it would be really nice to see prop manufacturers consider folding blades. So the first benefit is pretty obvious. It's going to be much easier to transport your quad because you just, the thing just folds in on itself. It doesn't take up any, any more space than it would if it didn't have props on, so that's fantastic. The next benefit is that when you do hit stuff, and I did hit stuff with these props, I don't know if this one, yeah, this one's got like some, uh, a nick on the blade here. I have another prop that has another nick out here. I have another prop that has, I don't know if I brought that one with me here, but there's, uh, here, there's another nick right here. These blades are polycarbonate, but you can see that they kind of get white lines when you flex them, so it's not like the best material, and it didn't break. That's really not a good test of anything, but it's possible that the blade is just folding back instead of breaking when you hit something. So for racing purposes, this may actually be really fantastic. Or if you are about to hit something and you just reduce your throttle real quick, the blade's just freewheeling and it'll just knock into stuff and it won't actually break. So that's one great advantage for racers. And I would say that the first props they should make in this category should be for racers. Another advantage, which isn't really advantage because it needs to be investigated, is that I believe that you can make these props repairable. Now, hold on. Let me explain my kind of design concept. So when I first started thinking about folding props, I thought these both these top and bottom plates could be one millimeter thick carbon, and you could just have holes in the carbon for the props to have pegs that go up and down. So you'd have two plates of carbon, you'd have the blade itself that has a peg that protrudes up and down, and then you just sandwich the, the carbon together, and it holds the pegs, and the prop can fold in and out on itself with the pegs. And then you just twist the um, prop nut down, you have like a washer or something in between, and it just kind of like squeezes everything together, and nothing can really exit it. It is possible to break the hub, but it's very unlikely, probably, unless you smack the hub, probably, I would guess, it would take a whole lot of testing. But the one millimeter thick carbon plates would probably hold up just fine, and they're one millimeter thick carbon plates, so they don't really weigh anything. They may actually end up weighing less than the hub on something like the S4 prop, which would be really great. And the props themselves don't really need to have any sort of hub. This, In this particular case, they have the pin in the actual hub, and the prop blade goes onto the pin, and then the thing sandwiches together. And there's no way to take them apart. Uh, it looks like they just fuse them together at the factory. However, the other way that I'm explaining, you don't need to have this big knuckle at the root of the blade. You just have two, two pegs going up and down. So it may actually end up making the prop notably lighter. It may not actually be heavier. It may actually be notably lighter, not just lighter. Also, let's forget about the carbon for a second. Now let's think about plastic hubs. So if you had a sandwich plastic hub with two halves, uh, with the, the center portion in the middle, and, and you know you just pop it on the shaft, and then you have these plastic portions that are kind of a little bit flexible. You can make it out of a somewhat flexible material. Not a TPU material, but almost like a TPU material. Bear with me here because I'm going to try to explain something that I don't have pictures or I don't have time to draw a diagram for. If that peg, I hope you understand the peg concept that I keep talking about, if that peg on the blade uh, protruding up and down from the bottom, from the, from the prop root that's going to enter the hub plastic, if that peg is not actually a peg, if it has a slope on it to, on one side, you could just squeeze it between these two plates of plastic and they would flex and the prop would just pop in place. If you do happen to break the blade, or let's, before back up, let's back up a second. Once it pops in place, the blade actually won't slip out because it's not feeling force from that sloped portion of the peg. Half the peg will still exist. It'll still be half a peg. The, the only one half of it, the inside half will be sloped so that you can pop it in place. When you do break a prop, you may be able to just turn it to the side here and once again push it using that sloped peg side and it can pop out of the plastic as well and you could just pop in a new blade, essentially making a repairable prop, which would be super cool. <laughs> Don't know if it'll work out, but I think it's worth investigating to see if it's possible. And another reason why I think this might be beneficial to investigate is that I think it would make it cheaper to produce props because instead of having to produce a prop that's this big, you have to produce one hub that can be the same hub that's being used for multiple props and then just create the blade. 
just one blade. So this mold becomes way, way smaller than anything else. Now, one factor which will play into this is that the balance may get a little bit screwy if you have multiple molds. So either you need to, you need to have props that are numbered in a mold, like you have a, a mold of like 10 blades, so you can make them 10 at a time, and the blades have to be numbered one through 10 so that you always use the same number on whatever hub. That might get a little bit complicated. Or you just have one mold and you just keep making tons of props out of that <laughs> one mold, which may deteriorate over time unknown but that kind of quality control can be figured out so I think there's a lot of potential benefits to investigating folding props and I've talked to the prop manufacturer they just haven't seemed very interested in it and they really don't have anywhere else to go I mean how, how where else can we go in the five inch category we have so many fantastic props now I mean it's worth investigating a new idea so hopefully that works out and maybe prop manufacturers will start thinking about folding props before I go, I'll give you one more bit of information about dentistry and, de and teeth in general. Implants are not teeth. Implants are implants. A lot of people think that dental implants, which is essentially just a screw, it's a titanium screw that's placed in the bone and then a tooth is put on top of that screw. Natural teeth have a muscle that attaches the tooth to the bone. There is a very thin ligamental muscle that goes around the roots of the teeth, and then that whole tooth and muscle complex sits inside the bone. So teeth kind of have these shock absorbers that move when you bang them or when you chew or when you function with them. Implants don't have that feature at all. Implants are locked to the bone. They are solid. Something that you lose with an implant is proprioception. Natural teeth have that ligament that has that natural shock absorber, but it also has nerve endings in that shock absorber. So when you bite down and you clench down, you can feel that you're clenching down hard. Now, it's not impossible to have proprioception with an implant. However, the proprioception is not coming from the implant itself. It's coming from your jaw flexing. <laughs> and they also have nerves for flexure in your bone, but it's totally different. It's a totally different sensation. It, it, I don't have implants, but I've, I've talked to patients and they say that it kind of sort of feels like you have wooden teeth, like you just bang on the tooth and it just, it resonates with your jaw. So I hope that was um, understandable. Uh, floss your teeth because you don't want implants. I do a lot of implants and they're great and they work fantastic, they look wonderful. They don't always work out, but you don't want implants. You don't expect to just replace your teeth with implants, it's not a good thing. Also. A full mouth of implants can cost upwards of $40,000, $50,000. There's some $60,000, $70,000 cases. A lot of high-end dentists are selling these full mouth rehabilitation implant-based cases for $100,000 plus. So don't expect to get a set of implant teeth later in life. Floss and brush your teeth now so that you don't have to go through that. Take care. Bye-bye.